The story you're about to see is based on documented fact, but as with most larger-than-life historical figures, time has blurred fact into folklore and folklore into history. However it's read, Sam Houston came this way and left his mark for all time. Reckon we're gonna fight tomorrow? Or just keep running? I don't know about General Sam or anybody else. But I'm gonna fight. Just as far as I'm running. You ain't scared, are you, son? Scared? That hole's one of my boots from running all over Hades and back. Too tired to be scared, Uncle Jimmy. Sure am dry mouth. Four bullets, four Mexicans. Don't need no bullets for that thing. <laughs> Texas. A republic will be born tomorrow. Or all the great glorious dreams will die with us here in this swamp. But I don't intend to die. And neither, I think, will Texas. So many lives slaughtered. Goliad, the Alamo. No, oh, by God, it's time the other fellas did the dying. we won't fight. We've been on the run for 36 days. <laughs> Everybody else figures me for a coward. Why not the Mexicans, too? I've been through the camp tonight. The men are angry. They're ready for a fight. They want revenge, Sam. With the Mexicans this close by, they can taste it. Well, General? Do we 
fight. We gotta get him back. Messages in the saddlebags. Says Santa Ana's going to get reinforced. Great. Maybe tomorrow. That's what this soldado allows. It's from General Cost. We'll arrive 531 infantry near Harrisburg, closing in on San Jacinto. That'll put them here tomorrow, General. All right, get him something to eat. I'd just as soon skin him, General. I said feed him! You'll get your fill of killing soon enough. Go on, get him out of here. Tom, don't you know another tune? No, sir. Only one I got figured out, General Houston. Come to the bower. You got any help, man? Well, no, sir. Not much. Just me and Dick, and then there's this one other fella. What about you, Dick? <laughs> I just keep time, General Houston. Whatever's the step. All right, boys. Play your love song. We can raise freedom to a love song. Maybe even better than the military march. Violent courtship in us. Play your love song. Freedom. My daughter, Eliza, in Tennessee in 1829. Houston was a very popular governor. He was the most handsome, the most intelligent, the most gifted man in all of Tennessee. He was 36 years old. My daughter was 19. Sir, Governor Houston, excuse me, you have a visitor here from Washington City, Mr. Van Fossen, sirs and ladies. Mrs. Allen, Colonel, Mrs. Houston. Governor, sir, I bring you greetings from the President of the United States. Yeah. 
It is an equally happy time in Washington as well. We plan for Mr. Jackson's inauguration. But that does not prevent him from offering to you these remembrances on this special night. This is Houston. With best wishes and fondest hopes for your future. Governor, sir, from old Hickory himself, a general's ration of fine executive elixir. <laughs> Thank you. Well, now we can do some celebrating. become a hero to the entire country. Does the gentleman dance to that sort of music at his wedding? Sam Houston does, darling. Come on. But to my family and to me, he was, I must say, a lousy bastard, and I sincerely wish I'd shot him through the heart the first time he came into my home.
on your wedding night. I'm dressing for a man for the first time. Coming to his bed. But it isn't the first time. myself and your friends. You're destroying yourself. President Jackson depends on you to control this state for him. It is my fixed decision, Colonel Williams. I am tendering my resignation. It is done. Sam, go back to the woman. Make amends. Your political enemies are hanging you in effigy in the streets, and you do nothing. Sam, you're a fighter. Now, don't let Colonel Allen's people force you out. You win nothing this way. If you let Allen drive you out of office, then the rest of the state will brand you a traitor and a coward for quitting. What man posts Sam Houston a coward? You, Colonel Williams. Sam, we're your friends. You owe us an explanation at the very least. He's right, Governor. Gentlemen, this is a painful, a very private affair. I'm deeply sorry, and I won't trouble you no more. I'm leaving Tennessee forever. <laughs>
Dealer faults. Too rich for me. Fortune has given up on me entirely, sir. Part is yours. You take it, stranger. I don't care to beat a man that's broken down already. I don't care to shoot a man mistakenly. You insult me, sir. I don't know what broke your spirit, my man, but your self-pity stinks. Dead men don't smell pity. You have a pistol? Houston! Houston. Sam Houston. And history will want to know who I killed tonight. James Bowie. You are indeed Sam Houston. My apologies, sir. I've heard of your misfortune. Mr. Bowie, please pick up the pot. Or some damn fool gets killed here. <laughs> Making a change in your life, why not come to Texas? That's why I've settled. What is the opportunity in Texas, Bowie? We can make millions. Houston, you could be a king. Texas? Mexicans might object. It's ours if we want it. The Mexicans can't hold it against an army of good men. We could revolutionize it in six months. Hell, there's only 5,000 people in all of Texas if you don't count Indians. done with grand schemes. Houston, listen to me. There are other women and other worlds to come. An opportunity like Texas doesn't come along every day. A million square miles and a government that can't hold it. I'm sorry, Bowie. Just don't have the blood for it anymore. I'm going back to live among the Cherokee. Quiet life in the woods. The hell with the rest. to the Cherokee then. Texas, sir. You should be free. She will be, Houston. It's just a crying shame you won't be there to share the glory. Colena, I greet you. It's good to be here, John. I've heard that a dark cloud has fallen on the white path you were walking. It is good that you have turned your thoughts to the Cherokee. It was caused by Yahuwah. We are in trouble, Raven. And Yahuwah has sent you to give us counsel. My house is yours. My people are yours. Come. Rest with us. Cherokee looking for His father was dead. 
Chief John John made the raven his son. The raven had been our champion over many years, many times against the hatred of the whites. He spoke for us to the great and powerful Andrew Jackson. My father was a white man. My mother's father was white. But I am John Jolly's cousin, and I am a Cherokee. Diana Rogers, my cousin. It is an honor to meet the Raven again. Diana. The Cherokee came from Tennessee to these lands along the Arkansas to escape the whites. The Raven had helped convince us to sell our homes and move west peacefully before we were killed or driven out for the gold in our hills. We have tried to become like the white man. We have taken up his language, his religion, his way of life more than any other tribe. We have taken in more whites. We even hold slaves like the whites. And for these things, we are resented. The raven joined in with the people. He did not stay outside the circle with the other whites, but became again one of us. He was a brother and a father to the people and the children. The Cherokee loved him, and I loved him too. still think of Tennessee and the white man's world? That's over. Our life here is hard, but you are much admired and greatly loved. It is a good thing the Raven has done, this peace between Osage and Choctaw and Cherokee. We are glad. No man has ever been so effective a peacemaker among the tribes as Sam Houston. No white man has ever been so respected. The Raven has a very great power. No Indian ever had such peacemaking magic. Once again, you have brought peace to the tribes, Raven. Shall we wager a horse on how long until the next battle? I have a vision of a Tika. Plan. Unite the tribes. The whites want this land. And eventually they may take it. I have been thinking about Tejas. The brothers, the Osage. The brothers, the Choctaw, and the Pawnee, and all the other tribes. Get mounted an army. 
Ten thousand mounted warriors to take Teos from Mexico and keep it an Indian nation, all of Texas, a confederation of tribes. We would kill each other. You see that? It is the nature of the tribes to test ourselves in battle. Texas is big enough. We could scatter the tribes, keep them away from each other. I will see to it that there is no war. You will be chief. I will be president. This will be a republic. An Indian republic. Think of it. I think, Raven, you want to be a king more than a chief or a president. And the king of Theos will need a queen. I swear that my plan will work. A free and united Indian nation, equal to Mexico, equal to the United States. No white man will ever steal your lands again. Think of it. An Indian empire. Yes. And I still think you just want to be a, a king. <laughs> the white men are going to come in waves like the ocean. And eventually they will destroy you all. Listen to me. I don't listen to whiskey talking. You're drunk. The liquor fueled the raven's dreams. Spirits in the liquor often made him a fool to our people. But I think he used the spirits more than they used him. The liquor always wore off while the dreams lasted. Such a fool. Such a failure. How can you love such a man? The Indian nation is no foolish scheme. I see it so clearly. I cannot make them understand. Like the raven, the eagle flies alone, Sam. Only the wind supports him. That's all he needs. Just fly. Others will follow. You search for courage in a whiskey bottle. But the spirits you need are inside of you. You are the eagle, Sam. Learn to fly and to trust your heart. And so, to fulfill all obligations and in full payment for Tennessee land surrendered by the Cherokee, the President of the United States, at the direction of the Congress, has offered these remunerations to the value of $50,000, redeemable by the Department of the Treasury. At such Show me the gold. At such time as is deemed appropriate and such monies are deemed available. We want to see the gold. 
by the Secretary of the Treasury and authorized by... Show us the gold! Open the strong box, Sergeant. were promised gold for their land. Where is it? Now, the Army is only an instrument of policy, Mr. Houston. This script was authorized by the Congress. It's all there is. Worthless paper for half the land in Tennessee. By God, sir, I'd have these men kill you. Now, Houston, the bill authorizing such payment was signed by President Jackson himself. The payment of worthless scrip for the Tennessee lands awoke the raven from his slumber. He vowed to go to Washington and plead the cause of the Cherokee before the lawmakers and President Jackson. With a renewed purpose and a new fighting spirit, my husband rode away. I could not know then that I would never live with him again, or that I would be with him only one more time in my life. saying that you did not come to Washington to help the Cherokee, but to get rich off the Indians. That you intend to set yourself up as the only agent for Indian contracts, the only trader to the Cherokees and the other tribes, so that you can steal from them. In fact, they say that you have stolen a fortune from them already, Sam. Look at me, Senator. Where is the fortune? How could I be stealing from anyone? The only reason I want the government contract to supply the Cherokee is because all the Indian agents are so corrupt. They say you got the Indians to give you all their paper money and that you will cash it in for gold, for yourself. I know what they say, Senator. I've read the papers. I've also offered to kill some of them if they don't apologize. Here comes your opportunity. That's the leader of the pack. That's Stanberry, honorable representative from the state of Ohio. Thank you, George. Stanberry! Sam Houston, you've been telling lies about me. Get away from me, Houston! I demand an apology. You're a lying swindler, Houston. I won't apologize! Then one of us is going to die. You tell me when and where. You're not gonna murder me, Houston. I won't fight a duel with you. Come here, Stanberry. I said get away from me, you Houston! Let's go far! I've never known anybody at the center of so many storms. You pulled a pistol on me, General. I know how to kill that yellow coward. You want a glass of bourbon? No. You gone and got religion? Well, I suppose not, living out there in the swamps with those heathens. I'll wager there is not one drop of Christian charity in that whole Indian nation. 
They keep their word when they give it, sir. Is that so? You promised the Cherokee gold, Mr. President. I promised them payment. I helped negotiate that treaty. You promised them gold. Mr. Houston, I am President of the United States, and you, sir, will show respect for me and for the office I hold. Which one of you lied to the Cherokee, the man or the office? That will do, sir. I don't care to discuss this anymore. Did you intend on keeping the promise when you made it? There is pitifully little gold left in the Treasury. And there are more claims against it than I can count. And the Cherokees will have to get in line behind the Washington bankers. Until then, they have to be content with what was said. You disgrace yourself and the office in their eyes. You disgraced yourself in my eyes. You deserted me in Tennessee. You ran out of the governor's house like a boy scared of a ghost story. I wrote you of my reasons. You let a woman drive you out of the highest office in the state. No more foolish all wages than fighting a duel over a woman of questionable reputation. <coughs> Don't you ever talk about my Rachel like that again. And you, sir, will never mention to me the events of Tennessee. You damn fool. You're as crazy as I am. It's a wonder either one of us are still alive. Hell, Sam, pour us some whiskey. the house. Good news or bad? The house has decided that Mr. Houston shall stand trial for contempt in the beating of Mr. Stanbury. You, sir, will be put before the entire House of Representatives. Congratulations, Sam. You have just made history. Congress has never tried to censure an ordinary citizen before. It's a first. They claim privilege because you've been a congressman yourself. It was a fortunate opportunity opportunity to serve several years in prison jackass i came here to speak for the indians but no one listened now i have the opportunity to speak directly to congress i'll risk a prison sentence for that mr president sam congress won't listen to you any more than i have you need a good lawyer i am a good lawyer sir but if you think you can defend yourself against that pack of hyenas in the U.S. Congress, then you'll believe I'm a ballerina in buckskin. I can be somewhat persuasive. Well, you are somewhat ridiculous in that outfit. John, would you introduce Mr. Houston to a tailor and a barber? Tell him you knew he was wearing a pistol. And you used the cane to ward off an attack. Truth is, Senator, I would have beat the man with or without the pistol. You better go lightly when you start sprinkling the truth around this town. People here seem to think it's poison. Retain Francis Scott Key as my attorney. Scott Key? The poet. You want a poet for a lawyer? I've written some poetry, Senator Buckner. And I've done some acting. I prefer Shakespeare. <laughs> Good heavens, Blair. What hasn't the man done? I have yet to perform on a national stage. Tomorrow I will address the house and the nation. Sam, quit moving about, for God's sake. <laughs> yes, I was waylaid in the street. Near my own boarding house. Attacked and knocked down by a bludgeon. Severely wounded and bruised. Oh, 
by Samuel Houston, late of Tennessee. The words spoken in my place in the House of Representatives. For which reason? I've been confined to my bed and unable to discharge my duties in the House or attend to the interests of my constituents. Mr. Houston, how do you respond to these charges? Mr. Speaker. Honorable sirs. Arraigned for the first time in my life on a charge of violating the laws of my country, I feel all the embarrassment which my peculiar situation is calculated to inspire. The charge which has been preferred against me is one of no ordinary character. But I have only to say to those who rebuke me, no sympathy, nor need. The thorns which I have reaped are of the tree I planted. They have torn me, and I bleed. Poetry? He's quoting poetry? Junius Brutus Booth said Mr. Houston could play Richard III with no more than a week's rehearsal. Well, what's Mr. Booth doing in Congress? He's fascinated by the trial, sir. Poetry. He might as well add trick dogs and charge a dime admission. There is a bright, undying thought in man that bids his soul still upward look to fame's proud cliff and longing, look in hopes to grave his name for after ages to admire and wonder how he reached the dizzy dangerous fight, or where he stood, or how. Sometimes they break out in applause. Other times you can hardly hear a single person breathing. He's got them spellbound. I take it Mr. Booth is still fascinated by the performance. Sits in the gallery, sir, front row. Or well, what about Houston? Has he ever entered the charge? Well, he sort of went right past it. Oh, he admits he beat the man, but he's got them thinking that Stanbury deserved it. And when I left, he was instructing them on liberty, tyranny, and the ill-treatment of the Cherokee by this government. <laughs> I would willingly give my life as a guarantee for the protection of the members of this house. I would be the first to protect them, the last to insult their feelings or to violate the sanctity of their persons. Sounds being as long-winded as usual. He never uses two words or 700 will do. Ah, thank you, Lonnie. So long as that flag shall bear aloft its glittering stars, bearing them amidst the din of battle, and waving them triumphantly above the storms of the ocean. So long, I trust, will the rights of American citizens be preserved, safe, and unimpaired.
Gentlemen, I ask you to join me in a toast to a great victory by the longest winded man alive. <laughs> If words were bullets, he could win a war single-handed. <laughs> to Sam Houston. Sam Houston. Sam Houston. Sam Houston. I'll raise my glass to the man I owe everything today. I was a forgotten man. I was dying out. Had they taken me in front of a justice of the peace and fined me $10 for assault, they would have killed me. Instead, I was given a national tribunal for a stage. And that set me up again. To Congressman Stanberry. <coughs> to Stanberry. Well, Stanberry. Here, here. Oh. To Stanberry. Here, here. To Stanberry. Here, here. Honorable Stanberry. So, what does Sam Houston do next? Go back to the woods and play Indian? <laughs> or are you going to try to make something out of yourself? I admit I do have a scheme, sir. One which could add a new empire to the United States. Now, it's not that Texas plan I've heard about where you get to be chief of all the Indians. <laughs> no, sir. I propose to take the Northwest from California to Canada and lay it at your feet. Well, now, Sam, that is a dazzling prospect, but the British might object to this their territory, you know. Or don't you know that? I can defeat the British, sir. It's been done before. Yes, it has. But no, no, Sam, I like your Texas plan better. There's a growing number of people out there. Enough for an army. They're just waiting for a strong man to lead them. And it's true, by and large, they're a bunch of adventurers. But you could pull them together. And what support would the president of the United States lend to a revolution in Texas, sir? None at all. Not officially, that is. <laughs> all right, sir. I'll go to Texas. I'll say it again, because I want each one of you boys to be able to swear that I said it. The President of the United States will give no aid whatsoever to a bunch of upstart revolutionary adventurers bent on stealing territory from our sovereign neighbors in Mexico. <laughs> Mr. Houston of Texas. Sam, Sam Houston, Houston of Texas. Texas. Houston. Rector, I want you to see to it that Houston gets to Texas. I want you to make sure he doesn't stop along the way and shoot somebody or get shot by somebody. But I don't want any more scrapes. One more misfortune befalling Sam Houston, and he's apt to write it right in here to the executive mansion. Well, sir, he said he feels he deserves a more illustrious traveling companion than a U.S. Marshal. I don't care what he feels. I'll tell him to get his jackass on a straight line to Texas or I'll kick it there. And I'm telling you to stick with him day and night till you see him cross Red River. And don't let him go off on some harebrained scheme before he gets there. Now, that's your job, Elias. I have every confidence that you can handle it well. Yes, sir, Mr. President. West, then south of Houston and his sleigh. I like the man's nerve. He had some contracts in his pocket to buy Texas land for some New York capitals and $500 in expense money. He carried a warrant from Jackson's War Department authorizing him to treat with Texas Indians. That's how it's in. Houston wanted to stop for his jerky wife as he rode south. She was some woman. And I could almost believe the talk about him wanting to take over Texas just to make her.
Water the jungle. Water the tree that we speak of. Washington's soup. Water the jungle. Houston believed in that eagle of his. It talked to him and became his spirit power, the way Indians believe in those things. As for his wife, I know he loved her, but once we turned from his place toward the Red River, why well, he never mentioned her again, and he never looked back. Shaking all the good luck I can wish for you, Sam. You're a good friend, Elias. I wish there was more I could do for you. Well, sir, there is one thing. Sam Houston rode into Texas with no real plan at all. At least none he confided to me. Just a dream and the self-confidence of a grizzly bear. And the son of a gun was on my horse. Tennessee. I've just moved to Texas. At the moment, I'm renting a room upstairs here. Now, I understand. I don't mind if you're all having a good time. I certainly cannot object to that. But since I can't sleep, I think I deserve a chance to introduce myself and to announce the fact that I'm setting up a law practice here in Nacogdoches. So, for any worthy cause or case, I offer you my services, and I guarantee they are the best. Now I'd like to buy the house a drink. Houston, I'll drink to that. We heard about you around here. Did you bring any of that nerve with you? Or just your big lower mouth? Oh, sir. I brought my nerve and my lawyer mouth. Put them both at your command. No need for us to bloody each other, friend. A lawyer, huh? Well, I'm gonna need a lawyer. Name's Rusk. Thomas Rusk. Mr. Rusk, let me buy you a drink. I hear the charge, please. Your Honor, 
These two scoundrels absconded from Alabama with $2,000 of my client's funds and fled here to Texas. Su honor, esa no es la acusión ante la corte. Sir, it is your man who is being charged with a crime. My clients charged this man with assault and damage to their person. Your Honor, he brutally beat my clients. Your Honor, Mr. Rusk was merely apprehending these worthless reprobates. Mr. Houston, right. you will not use those terms in my courtroom. It is your client who is being tried here. Sir, in no court in the land would Mr. Rusk be brought to task for trying to secure his Mr. Right. Houston, I will remind you that this is not your land. This, sir, is Mexico, and Mr. Rusk is being charged for a crime of which he is considered guilty until you prove him innocent. If I were you, I would get busy with that task. Forgive me, Your Honor. It is difficult to remember that things are so reversed here in Texas that a man can be swindled out of his entire fortune and you charge him with a crime when he tries to get his money back. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Now, Texas harbors scum like this and prosecutes a fine man like Rusk and things are upside down. And I suggest the honest folks of Texas consider a new set of laws to set things right. You will not preach revolution in my courtroom, Mr. Houston. Is it revolutionary to demand justice in Mexico, sir? Do not blame Mexico because Texas is full of scum like these. Remember the land of their origin. They murder and steal in your country, senor. Then scroll a sign on their door that says, Gone to Texas, where of course they continue to murder and rob and plot revolution against Mexico. The vermin breed in the United States, then come to Texas to spread their filth. Your Honor, after that heartfelt address to the court, the defense rests its case. Mr. Austin, I'm here in San Felipe to purchase Texas land. I'm here on behalf of some Eastern investors who would like to buy to... land. Nothing more? Well, I shall apply for a grant in my name as well, of course. I was told I had to make application to you, sir. Am I proceeding incorrectly? Uh, no, you, uh, you understand the legalities quite clearly, Mr. Houston. What I fail to understand is why you are making application for a grant of land from a government that you presently intend to overthrow by revolution. I intend nothing of the kind, sir. I am here on behalf of reputable clients who are willing to risk their money in Texas. Oh, I was under the impression that you and uh, Andrew Jackson were, um, let's see, what should we call it? Partners in this uh, Texas adventure? The President of the United States is not a land speculator, Mr. Austin if that's what's worrying you. Or am I a revolutionary? I'm an impresario. I administer more land here than the entire state of Connecticut. A responsibility for several thousand immigrants, and I have to deal with the government in Mexico City. And I will not betray that government, sir. A corrupt and distant government, ruling power over a vast territory with a population that loves freedom and independence. It sounds to me like the very prescription for revolution, Mr. Austin. I will consider your application. Oh, there is one requirement. If you were to receive land from the Mexican government, so you must be Catholic. And what are the exceptions to that rule, sir? None. Not even for you, sir. Perhaps I will be struck by a miraculous bolt of faith like lightning. Well, I'm off to Mexico City myself. I'll file your petition personally. I, I have business there. Mr. Austin, you're not going begging, I hope. No. No, I go to demand that Texas be made a free and independent Mexican state. That's a half step, Don Esteban. You want to be Mexican or do you want to be free? There is no need to fight with Mexico, sir. 
Half the Mexicans in Texas don't want to live under Santa Ana's heel, and none of the colonists. Don't you think you're fit enough, sir, to run Texas yourself as president? Or you, Houston? Or me, of course. Doesn't seem that big a task. Mexico City, sir. And I will try to find someone to instruct me in the faith of old Mexico. Padre! In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Welcome to the church and to Texas, Mr. Houston. Thank you, Padre. division to take up the march, made up of troops who are serving at Zacatecas. It says right here, these Texans will be ground down. No, no, Travis, no, no. sign no. those dispatches. Colonel Martin Perfecto de Cos, in command of the new garrison at San Antonio. The dictator's brother-in-law. This is no bluff. This is war, Sam. Very well be, but this is not the way to prepare for it. Has anyone mentioned a petition to Santa Ana? Petition? Dr. Dezavala, you helped put Santa Ana in power. You should know what's happening in Zacatecas. I helped make Santa Ana president of Mexico. But when he seized the powers of dictatorship, I fled here to Texas with a price on my head. In Zacatecas, the people have also revolted against his rule. Now he commands an army of 4,000 to crush out any resistance. That's... Not a reward for Dr. De Zavala's capture. It's a bounty on his head, delivered in a basket to Mexico City. That's Santa Ana's answer to petitions, Mr. Houston. Burnett is right. Now, what good would come from negotiating with a butcher like that? Blood may make Mr. Houston weak kneed. Not me. I say we ride into San Antonio. Right. We pull this perfecto de cost out of his bed and send his head to Santa Ana. He's right. See what the yeah, dictator right. thinks of that, huh? Right. It's right. time we put our army together. Right. It's time we took command of our own destinies. We're fools to wait. And fools to think that you're any match for Santa Ana's forces. He rides at the head of 4,000 professional killers. These are not young recruits. Houston, if you're afraid of a fight, get the hell out of here. Hold on, Burnett. Well, I don't know how many here have ever commanded troops in battle, but I know Mr. Houston, and he has. Now, if Houston preaches caution, then I second that. How will you fight, Mr. Burnett? In single file? Will you have time to coordinate your cavalry with your foot soldiers? 
Jim Fannin knows about these things. He went to West Point. For how long? A year? Long enough to get over being afraid. Gentlemen! 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 Please! Please, here comes Stephen Austin. Now, this man has sacrificed everything for Texas. I would like to know what he has to say. Don Esteban, what do you think? Well, I went to Mexico to plead with Santa Ana. Make Texas an independent state. An elected legislature. Now, you all know the months I spent locked in his jails. Now the dictator has decreed there is to be no more immigration into Texas. And he threatens to seize lands already granted to settlers. Now, I have also just received word that Santa Ana's army has, has subdued Zacatecas. And he has coldly executed thousands of his own countrymen. Now, I do not fault Mr. Houston's call for moderation. But we must defend our Texas. We must never let her suffer the cruelty of tyrants. We must fight. We must have war.
300 muskets, 30 kegs of powder, and 18 artillery pieces. We broke through walls from house to house. Those cannons were nothing up against us. You should have been that, General. Real prisoner man killed Kurt Burns. Sent him back to Mexico. They signed papers of parole that they would not fight in Texas again. Sweet victory, Sam. It's a disaster, Bowie. Five thousand more. Where are the rest of your troops? We told you. The war's over, Houston. Most have gone home. And I'm telling you, by March 1st, we have got to beat the prayer to meet an army of thousand. Probably led by the dictator himself. You don't know any of this, Sam. First thing you can do, Colonel Lee, is burn that mission to the ground. You don't tell me what to do, General. And you most certainly don't tell me to burn down the best fortification in Texas. We can never hope to defend this place. I'll send Will Travis with some men to help you blow it up. I took this place, Sam, and by God, I will hold it. With what? General Coast Command, this place is your small troop. How do you hope to defend it against Santa Ana? This is a death trap, Jim. And to destroy the animal. Surrender, otherwise the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered that demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the wall. Then I call on you, in the name of liberty, and patriotism, and everything dear in the American character, to come to our aid with all dispatch. Coronel Travis's letter is wrong about one thing. He says Santa Ana surrounds him with a thousand troops. I tell you, when I rode through that gate with this copper help in my hand, I saw twice that many soldiers. And sign of still more, Coronel Travis and the rest cannot last long against those odds. But what are we waiting for? Let's try! Let's have the forces as we go! Listen to me! Three days are arrived in the Alamo! Captain Cadiz and Santa Ana have the mission surrounded with thousands of troops. Cannot help Travis. Houston, we've got to run to San Antonio now. To die with Travis if we must. Yeah. Fernandez, you're a fool. This convention must first form a government. Then we can raise an army that stands a chance against six or seven thousand trained troops. Houston, you are a coward, sir. Let's ride! Stop this bad rest. There'll be no republic of Texas without a government. No government or we're all dead. Only chaos and disaster. Travis and Bowie are buying time with their lives. But you can form a government, not just a mob. Stay here. Give Texas something to fight for. I'll ride to Gonzales and round up whatever men I can find. And combine with Thanos 400 at Goliad. March to relieve the Alamo. Thomas, we need it here. Make sure these men stick it out. Don't let that fool Burnett run away with this convention. Lead us all to hell in a handbasket. Texas will forever be Santa Ana's wasteland. Texas needs a commander in chief of the army that'll fight. That's right. Yeah. I move we appoint Colonel Burleson to the post. Remove that Indian lover. And I move that we get to the task of forming a government. Let General Sam Houston try and save the army of Texas that's left. If anyone wishes to discuss this matter more deeply, let them step forward.
más fogatas. Pronto, hay más rebeldes muertos en la capilla. Quémalos todos. Hacemos con traidores.
General Sessma's lead force is just west of the Colorado. Gentlemen, there's our chance. A chance for what? Houston, we must turn and fight. There's been enough running. General Houston, Colonel Sherman. I can take my Kentuckians, cross that river downstream, hit the Mexicans from behind, and trap them all up against the riverbank. And what will that accomplish, Colonel? It will accomplish a victory, General. A badly needed victory. At what cost? How many Kentucky men dead? If you're afraid to fight, Houston. We're not. You really think I'm afraid to fight, Baker? You're gonna lose this whole army unless you make a stand now. Half these men want to go back to their families, and we now have more refugees than fighting men. 
This retreat has caused a general panic. General. The slaves running free everywhere since this panic started. And some of your Indian friends are starting to raid all over Texas since we've been running. Men have got to protect their families if you won't do it. General Houston! General Houston! Message from Colonel Fannin at Goliad, sir. They're all captured, sir. Near 400 men. Fannin's men? Him, too. He's bad wounded. We was trapped. Right in the open. He didn't have no choice, sir. He sent me out and give a sword to General Urea. You look done in. Get some food and coffee in you. Houston, your army is dwindling away. If you don't fight now, there'll be nothing left to fight with. And nobody left to fight for! We've got one hope, Colonel Sherman. We've got to draw Santa Ana's supply line so thin they'll snap. We'll move the army to Grosses on the Brazos. El Presidente Santana orders your death, sir. Uh, I surrendered my men with honor, sir. And with guarantees. They're marchers. They tell me, Louisiana. How far is that? 300 miles, maybe more. They're wearing dress uniforms. No packs, no baggage. I don't think we're going to Louisiana. They're going to shoot us, ain't they? Compañero, ato! Nos quedamos, soldaditos. Para la derecha, adelante! Adelante! Es esto! the browsers for and we could be marching to mexico city we could take over all of mexico while santa anna's up here chasing your elusive mr houston all the hell and gone you want satisfaction you want glory ride with me to mexico i'm with you i'm with you all the way mr Hockley. sir I want some graves dug Right over there. Someone die, sir? Somebody might. It's all done, sir. You know what these holes are for? Mr. Lamar! They look like graves to me. They are graves, sir. And I'll make a promise to all of you. Any man who goes through my camp beating for volunteers for any misadventure is gonna lie in one of these holes. I want all you officers to make sure that every man here marches past these graves and gains an understanding of my warning. 
We have a short time here to turn this mob into an army. I want no more distractions. Hey, mister. Fix my rifle, will you? Hammer won't stand locked. Sorry, sir. Come back in an hour. I'll have it fixed for you. General Houston, my name's Kirkendall. I come all the way down here from Kentucky. When do we fight, sir? Glad you're here, son. You just worry about keeping your powder dry. I'll fix your rifle and run the army. Is that all right with you? Yes, sir. So, Houston. Thomas. You're here to volunteer? I'll bring you a letter from the president, sir. Jackson? President of Texas. Who's that? Burnett! President of the Republic? Why not just shoot me in the back instead? Burnett! That hog thief, that rattlesnake. Read the letter, Sam. Now, Burnett wants you to turn your army around immediately and fight, sir. Burnett is telling me when to fight. And if you refuse the order, I'm instructed to remove you from command, Sam. Well, I refuse the order, and I refuse to be removed from command. Look at that army, Thomas. They're worn out. They're not trained. They're ill-fed. They're ill-clothed. And look at here. San An is in San Felipe. He has burned the town. Sesma is here crossing the Colorado in force, not three days out. Ure is right in here, moving east, with another 2,000. Now, it's all I can do to keep these soldiers between the Mexicans and the government at Washington on the Brazos. The government is no longer at Washington, Sam. Now, President Burnett and everyone else has fled to Harrisburg on Buffalo Bio. Burnett is already running away, and he has the nerve to order me to fight. Everyone is scared that you can't protect him, General. Now, your own officers are reporting to Burnett. They say you refuse to fight, Sam. I realize that the whole of Texas is in a panic. I lose 50 soldiers a day to desertion. Well, this army has only one fight in them. And I'm going to pick the time and the place for that one battle. To hell with my officers! Who's elected vice president? Lorenzo de Zavala. Potter, Secretary of the Navy. Potter. Another damn hog thief. What the hell is this? Houston? Yes, sir. Sergeant Quinn, sir. We come to join your little scrap, sir. From where? Louisiana. Those are American army muskets, sir. Do I see Jackson's fine hand in this? We are all free men and volunteers here, sir. But General Gaines has 2,000 troops along the Sabine. Well, I am sure as hell glad to see you here in Texas. Sergeant Quinn. Do me the favor of marching your volunteers right down the middle of this encampment. Give everyone a chance to see what real fighting men look like. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Shoulder, arm, forward, march. Left, left. Thomas, may it please you and the government and all the rest of my critics I know that this army may be beginning to get some fight into it. Santa Ana's moving across the Brazos towards Harrisburg after President Burnett and the government towards Harrisburg and Buffalo Bayou. 
How near Harrisburg, Mr. Arnold? He's coming up fast from Fort Bend, sir. Tranana moves with any speed. They can cut us off, General. Maybe I'll let him get there ahead of us just to see how scrappy President Burnett and his armchair generals might merely be. If the government's captured, sir, that'll be the end of it. All right. Gentlemen, form up your troops. We'll move at sundown and march through the night. Burles is right! I think we should talk strategy right here. Well, I don't, Colonel Sherman. Any plans I share with you, your spies will carry back to President Burnett. And I don't want the Mexicans intercepting your dispatch. Gentlemen, that's the Harrisburg. Santa Ana's down that way. Chief, stay with the civilians and guard the wagon train. General Houston, I was ordered to ride from the Alamo. I will not stay behind now to guard women and baggage. If my men from Behar had not wanted to fight, we would have stayed home to guard our own families. I withdraw the order. Keep it moving, boys. Don't let those Kentucky men out for Sherman and Lamar and them is mixing it up with the Mex Calvary. you not to engage the enemy unless it's half. They fire cannon at us, you sir. I don't care if they rain brimstone down your collars. My orders will be respected. Mr. Lamar, I also hold you responsible for this action. But you are a fighter, sir. I commend your courage. I said we ought to have Colonel Sherman in charge of this army. He wants to fight. He got his men into two scraps already. I say if Houston don't fight tomorrow, then we pull Houston down and put Sherman in his place. Well, what about Lamar? After what he done? We just need one man to get on a horse and say charge. We can do the rest. If Houston don't want to fight tomorrow, we'll find somebody else who can. No more running. After 9 o'clock in the morning, boys, Houston's still asleep. Hundreds of Mexicans just over the rise. I don't understand. I just damn don't understand.
General, you better wake up. General, Santa Ana did get reinforced. Those 500 under General Cost just marched in. They're pitching camp. He's had most of the rest of them up all night, building barricades. Thank you, Mr. Smith. doing any more than you are. We got a glass on him this morning at sunup. He's just walking around. Appeared to me be a little lazy. Wasn't giving any orders. Any more than you are. I think he figures to rest up for a while. Stand by, Mr. Smith. I may have work for you. You have a good night's sleep, General? Yes, sir, I had a very good night's sleep. First I've had in a long time. How'd you sleep, son? I slept fine. Are you up for a fight? General, I reckon every last one of us is up for a fight. Smith. It's going to be a good day to fight a battle. Near two o'clock. Call my officers and go cut down Vince's bridge. That's the only way out of these swamps, General. You can't retreat. I know that. Cut it down. Today we're all going to fight or die. Down, boys. No place to go. 
You might be shattered. You must not move it. The sun on us got this entire victory is meaningless. Sam, the ferry's guarded. Vince's bridge is down. But we'll find him, sir, if he lives. And rest and try to enjoy your triumph. How many men dead? We count 630 dead Mexicans, sir. Over 600 prisoners so far. What are our losses, Mr. Hockley? We lost six men, sir. We have 24 wounded, that's all. Kissing me, I'm gonna no. myself. There you are, fella. Keep yourself alive. Antonio Lopez de Santana, Presidente de Mexico, Commander-in-Chief of the Army of Operations. I place myself at the disposition of the brave General Houston. Shoot him! You may consider yourself a man born with no common destiny, Senor Houston. For having conquered the Napoleon of the West. But now it remains with you to be generous to the vanquished. You should have remembered that at the Alamo, you butcher and son of Satan. Shoot him! Kill 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 him! I summoned them to surrender. They refused. Why don't you let us have a little weasel, General Sam? We'll roast him for dinner. <laughs> Rockley, get some paper. General San Anna is going to write a note to all his generals, ordering them to surrender or march back into Mexico, south of the Rio Grande.
It was my destiny. What is the name of this place where I have fallen? San Jacinto. In the Republic of Texas. <laughs> General's tired and busy. Tell him the president's on the field of battle. Rockley? Yes, sir. I want to dictate a letter to the president. President Burnett, sir. Oh, not that hog thief, the president. <laughs> Andrew Jackson. Houston, my congratulations. Brilliant victory. Thank you, sir. I didn't expect to see you. I was told you'd bought a boat and sailed away to Louisiana. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> they lied. Where is Santa Ana's body? It's in that tent out there. If you like, I'll have it marched over here for you. You mean you didn't kill him? I need him alive. There are three more Mexican armies in Texas, each one of them larger than ours. We are in grave danger. Mr. Houston, your wound is obviously severe, incapacitating. You are relieved of this command. No, no, no. Mr. Rest, you are now in command of all military forces in Texas. Bring that civilian aboard this ship. He's leased to the government of Texas. I've taken over 29 chips of bone out of the general's leg, sir. I'm afraid of gangrene. You must take him to hospital, sir. Otherwise, he, he will die. No. General, I'm honored to welcome you aboard the Yellowstone. Thank you, Captain. Looks like we might have a fight here, sir. What's wrong? The president does not want Mr. Houston to board. I am captain of the Yellowstone. General Houston will be aboard this ship, or she will not go to Galveston nor anywhere. General Houston's army kills 700 Mexicans. Are you sure you want to try to keep him off this boat?
Texas. <laughs> She's yours now, boys. Keep her free. Sam Houston survived his wounds and became president of the free and sovereign Republic of Texas. He finally succeeded in getting Texas into the United States, only to see it all come undone in civil war. Houston was twice elected president of the Republic of Texas. He then served 13 years as a U.S. Senator from the state of Texas. He was twice elected governor, but then he refused three times to take an oath to the Confederacy and was dismissed from office. Houston withdrew from public life and he died in Huntsville, Texas in 1863. He was convinced at the end that his life had been a terrible thing.